All right, good morning and afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Today we have uh, two large sessions that cover a variety of LiDAR remote sensing and 3D mapping related topics. Uh, presentation from Maxar Technologies. And then finally a workshop on uh, multivariate mapping with ArcGIS to top to end the day off. Uh, a little bit of a friendly reminder to our presenters to please try and uh, enter your sessions early so you can test your connections if you have not done so already. Uh, we've been experiencing a few technical issues and obviously they can happen to any of us and usually at the most inconvenient time. So check your connections if you get a chance. Uh, again, I'd like to acknowledge the generous support from Maxar, Eclipse Geomatics, Center of Geographic Sciences, and Go Geomatics have provided to us and encourage you to help us uh, show support and check out their area in the exhibit area, exhibit hall along the left area there. And uh, now I want to take a few minutes to introduce our second keynote speaker, Dr. Tim Webster. Tim's research focuses on mapping and modeling processes in the coastal zone. Uh, Tim introduced me to remote sensing when he was completing his master's degree at Acadia University and uh, later on he convinced me to go to COGS where I took uh, applied geomatics research and I actually got my uh, first uh, taste of LIDAR. Uh, several years later I don't use it daily but uh, it's been one of those things that I've got uh, and it, it, basically that program and Tim's, Tim's uh, the taught me hands-on experience coupled with the appreciation and understanding that you really need to know the theory first, and that's always helped me get ahead in my career. Um, a little bit later on, when I moved back to Nova Scotia and was president of GANS, uh, I was able to present Tim with the Geomatic Association of Nova Scotia Award of Distinction for his dedication and extensive flood modeling work around here in Land Canada. Uh, it doesn't seem like uh, a year goes by when we don't have uh, C. Tim or, or his crew on CBC or one of those things doing the local stuff. Uh, Tim's group focuses on research utilizing airborne LiDAR sensors where they visualize 3D data and virtual reality and mixed reality to aid a better understanding of our environment. And in fact, um, there's not too many bathymetric, topo bathymetric LiDAR sensors in Canada, so it's, uh, they've quickly become the experts in that uh, so-called gray area or the near foreshore portion of the coastal zone where Traditional LiDAR systems and bathymetric systems have a hard time acquiring good data to model of what, what we have going on here. So therefore, on behalf of the Canadian Cartographic Association, I'd like to welcome Tim to our annual conference. Uh, it's fortunate to have you join us here today. Without further ado, I will pass things off to you. Thank you very much, Ted. Um, I hope everything is working correctly and everybody's hearing me. Uh, I'd like to mention that Ted uh, recently was uh, presented that same honor I was uh, for uh, the Geomatics Association in Nova Scotia. So uh, congratulations back Thanks, to him. And uh, I'm not surprised to see the, the breadth of his skill and uh, uh, knowledge for organizing conferences and helping out. Uh, we've had some conferences at COGS and Ted's been uh, uh, there on behalf of GANS and helped organize it and uh, great to work with. Thanks, okay. Tim. Without further ado, I will uh, start sharing my screen and kick off the presentation. So for those that may not be aware of uh, who the Applied Geomatics Research Group is, uh, basically we're a spin-off research group from COGS uh, we were established in 2000. Uh, myself, Bob Mayer, and David Colville started things off, and uh, now I basically run that AGRG group and have anywhere from about 10 to 20 people with me. So I'd like to make sure I, <coughs> excuse me, acknowledge uh, <clears throat> the major contributions from my team uh, for this presentation. Okay, so in this keynote, uh, I'd like to go over a variety of things about LiDAR. First, try to lay out some theory um, and then move through the different technologies. So I, I guess first, uh, one thing that makes LiDAR quite different uh, is it's an active sensor. So it supplies its own energy source, very similar to radar. Um, uh, one of the key aspects. LiDAR is a fair weather system. Uh, so if it's uh, raining, foggy, smoke, aerosols in the air, uh, this will affect the laser pulse, and uh, typically it's problematic to get good data. 
We'll go over some uh, laser ranging principles, how it works, and what's involved, what's taking place in the background. We'll talk a little bit about the components of a LiDAR system, so a laser, an inertial measurement unit, uh, GNSS, scan mechanisms. We'll talk a little bit about range resolution because you don't, you don't always hear that. And that's really related to the pulse width and the ability of the system to resolve between objects, uh, between targets. And every sensor has a dead zone, which is basically the, the finest resolution that you can see something and resolve it from something else. We'll talk about LiDAR wavelengths and the applications. Uh, a variety of different systems use different wavelengths depending on their purpose. Other factors, we'll discuss pulse repetition frequency, beam divergence, return, number of returns, intensity, uh, whether imagery is involved or not. Um, something I'm not going to talk a lot about is LiDAR bore sighting and, and calibration. And this is actually very, very important if you're operating a LiDAR sensor. And what that's about is aligning the GPS antenna uh, and receiver information with the inertial measurement unit and the LiDAR sensor. And it's a, basically a combination of measuring offsets between the sensor and those other uh, devices and measuring any rotation angles. And then lastly, uh, we'll move, it, move into the different LiDAR platforms, starting with airborne topographic LiDAR, topobathometric LiDAR. As Ted mentioned, we have uh, some quite a bit of experience with that. Terrestrial LiDAR, mobile LiDAR, and then finally into a drone situation. So, first off, you're not going to see me spelling LiDAR, capital L, small i, capital D-A-R. Um, I've published several papers of which... Uh, it's becoming more common practice just to spell it LIDAR, very similar to radar and sonar. Uh, it's becoming a commonplace name. So here's my pitch to, uh, to move towards that. Now, the basic principles of laser ranging systems are we emit a pulse from the uh, transmitter of the laser, and we listen, we listen, we listen. That pulse goes out, reflects off a target, some of the energy comes back and is received. This is the return pulse that we see from the reflected object. Now, this represents the two-way travel time. So to calculate the range to the target, it's the two-way travel time times the uh, speed of light, which we consider to be a constant, even though we are no, lo no longer in a vacuum, uh, divide it by two. So you can imagine we need a very precise clock uh, to measure that two-way travel time. And on a LiDAR system, that's known as the time interval meter. Now, this is a nice idealized pulse coming back. It looks the same as the pulse that was sent out. However, depending on the material that the laser pulse hits, the geometry, so the angle of incidence, uh, et cetera, the shape of that returning pulse can be different. We can have a, a very narrow return, strong pulse, or we can have a broader pulse, more for something, say, reflecting from vegetation. And you can imagine its decisions have to be made as to when to say that, when to measure the time that that pulse has returned. And that timing can actually affect the range. Um, so there's a few little things in the background there to be, to be aware of. Okay, let's talk about the LiDAR components. There's the laser ranging system itself, so the, la the laser scanner. There's the inertial reference system, so or inertial navigation system. And this is typically comprised of the GNSS receiver. So we have a, a GPS base station, and we have GPS survey grade in the aircraft. As well, we have an inertial measurement unit. The GNS is typically taking a positional measurement one every one to two uh, measurements per second. The IMU, on the other hand, is measuring typically at a frequency about 200 times per second, so 200 hertz. And this is measuring, of course, pitch, roll, and heading. Now, it's interesting. I want to—I always point out to, uh, to, to new people in this idea of IMUs that notice the typical accuracy of the IMU. For roll and pitch, it's 0.0025 whereas the heading is only 0 0.005, so half as accurate. And that's because when we're shifting our heading, we're not moving against the gravitational field like we would with pitch 
or roll. And these IMUs are, are basically accelerometers uh, that can measure those gravitational changes. So always remember the heading is going to be less accurate than the, uh, uh, the pitch and the roll. Other important characteristics of the LIDAR, and I apologize if these graphics don't quite tell the story I'm hoping to, but when the LIDAR fires, there's something called the pulse width. So how many pulses of energy, of, of, of light, uh, does the system send out? And you'll see here that the range resolution can be determined by the pulse length times the speed, um, uh, the pulse width times the speed of light uh, divided by two. So systems that have a very short pulse length can typically resolve objects that are quite close together. And the ver various curves here somewhat demonstrate that. You can imagine if you have uh, two targets, one and two, that are quite close together. And these are the different uh, pulses coming back for each um, pulse length that is sent out. You can see that we can't really convolve or deconvolve two separate pulses here. Um, here, we possibly are able to start, but here on the third diagram, we can clearly see we have two distinct pulses. Um, so that's what it's really getting to. For example, we owned an, an old Optech ALTM 3100, state-of-the-art equipment back in 2005. It had a dead zone of about two meters, which meant if you had objects on the ground vertically separated by two meters, you would not be able to resolve those um, until they were separated by a distance greater than two meters. I think the diagram, the lower right diagram, shows you different pulse widths and you can see on a, hot, a large pulse width, we have these three broad peaks. But as we narrow the pulse width, we actually have these multiple, uh, much more high resolution, much more defined um, range measurements that we can make. So always when you're looking at LiDAR systems, think about the pulse width and ask about the dead zone and what is the range resolution. Now, let's talk a little bit about the wavelengths. Some of the common wavelengths used uh, for LiDAR systems, 515, 532, 856, 850 is used sometimes, 905, 1064, and 1550. So let's, let's break those out a bit. Bathymetric LiDAR uses wavelengths in the green part of the spectrum, uh, 515 and 532 nanometers. For sure, the bread and butter wavelength uh, for topographic LIDAR is the near-infrared 1064 nanometer wavelength. Probably any LIDAR data that you've been dealing with probably is flown with a topographic LIDAR using 1064 nanometers. 1550 and 905 are very common for the terrestrial mob and mobile mapping systems. So these are either tripod or mounted on a vehicle with a navigation system. Now, we always have to be concerned about eye safety, and what this really amounts to is the amount of power, the amount of wattage that the system is putting out, and the duration that you would be exposed to it. Uh, so all of these, light, these laser systems are all have an eye safe uh, rating. And really, they can, the manufacturer control that by things like the amount of power, uh, the divergence angle, the pulse duration, uh, and the direction, and somewhat the wavelength as well. For example, 1550, uh, a lot of the energy is absorbed by the liquid in our eye, so it, it can't get back to the, uh, the retina and uh, do any damage there. So those are some of the common wavelengths. Now let's talk a little bit about beam divergence. What makes LIDAR such a fantastic tool for mapping in, in vegetated areas, mapping the ground, is the very narrow beam divergence that most systems have. The beam divergence, as we see here on this left diagram, is measured in terms of milliradians. So a narrow beam divergence, like 0.3 milliradians, at a 1,000 meter altitude or above ground level, would have a 30 centimeter diameter footprint of the LIDAR. And, and this is typical. Most uh, topographic LIDARs typically around 20 centimeter footprint. 
And of course, this is why when you're in the forest and you look up through the canopy, if you see some holes in the canopy and see the sky, chances are some of those LIDAR pulses will be able to make their way through that and reflect back. If we have a higher beam divergence, a larger beam divergence of 0.7, we see that we end up getting a larger footprint. This is sometimes uh, used for doing corridor mapping, where you're trying to map a, a power line, a narrow cable, and you just don't want to have those narrow pulses miss the cable. So therefore, you go for a larger pulse width, or, a lar or excuse me, a larger beam divergence, hoping that some of that energy will will be uh, will reflect back off of the wire. Okay, and it's very easy to calculate the milli radians times the altitude equals the beam, di the, uh, the beam uh, uh, footprint diameter. Let's look a little bit at the scan pattern up in the top right here. Um, this was the scan pattern of the ALTM. It had an oscillating mirror that would go back and forth directing the laser pulses. As the aircraft advances forward, we end up getting this, this zigzag or sawtooth pattern. Uh, this had some issues with it at the edges of the scan where the, the mirror had to slow down and stop and reverse directions, we would sometimes get some artifacts. Uh, we can also have elliptical scan patterns or, or circular scan patterns where the sensor, there's no stopping and starting of the mirror, it is continuously moving in the same direction. Uh, this has some advantages of being able to go up vertical surfaces a little more effectively than the uh, uh, the sawtooth pattern. Next, let's talk about the number of returns. And this is very important to sort of new users to the LiDAR uh, world. Always remember that one LiDAR pulse, pulse length, can actually result in multiple returns. So sometimes I'll see confusion in, in RFP requests for proposals or specifications that talk about point density versus pulse density. If you define something with pulse density, then you're saying there has to be that many pulses per square meter um, throughout the, uh, the area, if you want a certain uh, ground density as an example. Now remember though, that if you stated it in point density, one pulse could produce multiple points. You know, sometimes now up to 12 points per pulse, depending on the vegetation canopy or, or other materials that the system is going through. So remember the difference between pulse density and, and point density and how they can be quite different. Okay, <coughs> excuse me again. Topographic LIDAR, by far the most uh, common, it's, it's revolutionized the ability to how we collect topographic uh, elevation data and uh, basically is the go-to technology now. Uh, here we can see collecting a swath. Uh, in this diagram here, it's a little mis, uh, misleading. We see a variety of pulses, and it implies as if the energy is reflected vertically back. Of course, that energy is reflected uh, in many different directions, that backscattered energy, of which some of it will come back uh, up into the sensor and be recorded by the receiver. Um, some people often will think about, um, oh, I want to use the last return to build a bare earth model. However, the last return uh, could actually be off the top of a building. So um, that not, is not necessarily always the case to use the return numbers. And I'm just showing here some other examples of uh, uh, point density and, and different elliptical scan patterns or circular. Okay, I thought I'd delve a little bit into uh, AGRG's history here. Uh, we contracted some companies to fly LIDAR back in 2000 here in the Annapolis Valley. And if you just look on the right-hand side here, uh, you'll see the fixed-wing aircraft is flying an Optech sensor, and it had a pulse repetition rate of 5,000 hertz, or 5 kilohertz, so 5,000 shots per second. Uh, in 2003, this was Terra Remote Sensing with a uh, helicopter-based system, mostly for corridor mapping. But their their pulse dense, their pulse repetition got up to 10,000 hertz. And then in, a year later, they had a, a refined system that it got up to 30,000 
hertz. And you'll see the other specifications here about the footprint and so forth. So in the 90s and 2000s, we were definitely into the thousands of, of pulses per second. So in the order of kilohertz. Today, just like computers and everything else have gotten faster, today we're into the millions of pulses per second. So you'll notice when you look at any specification of LIDARs today, they'll be talking about two megahertz. So two million pulses per second. It's quite amazing. So oh, who are the players in the LIDAR manufacturing world? And this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, this is just my take on who I see out there. Uh, Leica, uh, I believe, is the biggest manufacturer in terms of the most systems out there. So it's Leica, Optech, and Regal. So Leica has recently released something called the Terrain Mapper 2 and the City Mapper 2. And there it is, 2 million pulses per second uh, with a 0.23 millirad beam divergence and up to 15 returns per pulse. Now, what's interesting about their approach as well if you look here at the sensor head, so this is what sits in the fuselage of the aircraft and, and looks out the bottom, uh, all of these, these camera systems are at different angles. So there's six different cameras involved there, red, green, blue, and near infrared, to capture the facades of the buildings and so forth. Optech has the Galaxy, which again is a two megahertz system, and it has a variable beam divergence depending if you're doing terrain mapping or power line mapping, you can broaden the beam divergence. It has eight returns, up to eight returns, and an optional RGB camera. Regal, they have a, a ton of LiDAR sensors. Uh, here is the VQ1560, has two lasers built into it, same wavelength, 1064, and they claim four megahertz, but really when you read the fine print, it's the two lasers firing at two, two megahertz uh, each. I noticed I made a typo on my slide. It says 200 megahertz. That's incorrect. So that should be two megahertz. Um, and there you can fly that kind of pulse density if you're at only 1,600 meters altitude. If you fly up at a f higher altitude, you have to reduce the pulse frequency. And that has to do with you can't be firing pulses that are going to be bouncing back to the aircraft and getting confused with which pulses are outgoing. There's something called MPIA, multiple pulse in air. And I'm not going to go through it in this, uh, in this presentation, but it basically allows the pulses to be separated as you fly higher and higher altitude, so that the system doesn't get confused as to which pulse is which. Let's talk briefly about the LiDAR processing. So oh, as I showed in the initial diagram, um, the system really works with a series of waveforms. Laser pulses are sent and uh, waveforms are captured. Some of the early systems converted those waveforms to discrete points right on board the system. Nowadays, many systems are actually capturing the waveform and converting it to discrete points as well. The data gets processed into a binary LAS standard format. Uh, the current one we're on is LAS 1.4. The data is initially processed for each flight line. And on the right-hand side here, you can see uh, the variable flight lines when we moved out, out over water and we were only picking up the nadir shots. So it's processed for each flight line after the trajectory is processed. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then, in order to process the data, we have to break it up into tiles. And as the data volumes get larger and larger, we sometimes have to break the data into smaller and smaller tiles in order to process those and classify what those points are. And at the very minimum, we're looking to classify the bare ground. TerraSolid produces a product called TerraScan. There's a variety of other spin-off products, but it's by far, I would say, the industry standard for LiDAR classification. Their standard classes have been defined by ASPRS. And the last, what's great about the last format is that it also stores information on the echo code. Uh, so is it the first of many returns, the last of many? Um, uh, the return or the return number can be defined. The intensity 
So the amplitude of that reflected pulse, which will vary based on material, the GPS time, the scan angle, and, and some other information. Now, the elevations, really, we're just measuring the range from the laser. The elevation, the position, is defined through your trajectory, which is defined through your GPS and your IMU processing. So therefore, at the initial stage, the elevations are referenced to the ellipsoid. And for many applications, we want those converted to orthometric heights or height above mean sea level. So here's, an, here's a look at the standard classes. So class number one is unclassified. Class number two is ground. Sometimes you'll get a point cloud that that's the minimum information, class one and two. Other things, we can have the low vegetation, high vegetation, buildings, power lines, et cetera. On the right-hand side, I'm showing the relationship between the Earth's surface, the ellipsoid, which is how we reference the GPS position, and then finally the geoid, which is an equipotential gravitational surface, which means if you were to hold a plumb bob, that line would be basically pointing perpendicular to the geoid through to the center of the Earth. So we need a geoid model to convert the data from ellipsoidal heights to geoid heights or orthometric heights. And the two most common models in Canada are CGDV 28, which was from 1928, loosely, and a new model they, that the federal government would like people to use, which is CGVD 2013. Okay, let's jump again back into some uh, AGRG experience. Um, Chris Hopkinson uh, was involved uh, with AGRG at that time and was instrumental in uh, uh, working on the CFI grant to get us this system. So we obtained a ALTM 3100 in 2005. It could fly from an altitude 80 to 3,500 meters. It had 100,000 shots per, uh, per pulse or, or um, a pulse rate, pulses per second. Uh, at 100,000, we had a lot of signal-to-noise ratio, so it was more typical to, for us to fly it at 70 uh, kilohertz. Uh, we could get four returns plus intensity, and it would scan from nadir off to 25 degrees, and it had a, uh, an accuracy of better than 15 uh, centimeters. Oh, when you get your point cloud, you know, yes, LIDAR is extremely accurate. If you have a good GPS and a good IMU and a good laser system, you know, we should be able to get that 15 centimeter absolute accuracy quite easily. Now the systems are even down to uh, 6 to 10 uh, centimeters. However, we still need to have good LIDAR classification. It's, it's a little tough to see, but here are using all of the returns, and we can see it's steep steep cliff along the, uh, the Bay of Fundy coast here. And if we look at the ground returns, it's a little hard to see, but the cliff is not as steep. And if we do a profile through here, we can see the there's the true cliff position, but in the ground, the bare earth DEM used by gridding the, uh, the ground points only, we can see the cliff has stepped back, but this is in fact incorrect. This is because the ground points at the top of the clip have not been classified properly. They've been misclassified. And this is a common problem with the, the automated algorithms. Um, so if you have an environment where you have some of these steep-sided features that, you, um, that want to be included in the ground class, very good to tell your LiDAR provider that first, that they really should pay attention to these objects. And secondly, those are the first things I check when I get a data set from a, uh, from a vendor. We used to see also conditions if we had a large, say a big box store, maybe the edge of the building would be properly classified, but then lo and behold, in the center of the flat roof, we used to see ground points again. Uh, I think those algorithms have been improved for building classification since that time. Okay, uh, here's an example of a, a survey uh, on the New Brunswick shore from the ALTM sensor. Uh, the first thing we see, we process the trajectory, and these flight lines were planned with 50% overlap. So the trajectory is where we take the base station GPS, the aircraft GPS, the IMU, we blend that all together, 
figure out where the aircraft is going. From there, we link up the time of the LiDAR swaths, and we now have our LiDAR swaths. And lastly, we go through, or this is a cross section of the coast, we through, go through and see um, the ground classification. Now, here's some uh, work I did in my PhD in the Annapolis Valley, and I know all of the old COGS graduates here are going to be looking and going, oh, there's Lawrencetown. I've looked at those satellite images for years and years back uh, when they used to force us to study the valley and, and so forth. These were 4K tiles back in 2000. This is just showing a Landsat image to give you an idea of what the cover type is. This, these data were flown in July. So here are the ground points. So the open areas are basically saturated with points and a little sparser in the forest because of the leaf canopy. There is our digital surface model. So the, uh, even though it looks like an aerial photograph, the colors here are red is the highest, blue is sea level. And we can see the, uh, the roads, the cleared areas, a, uh, a, a wetland in the center. And of course, now the power becomes when we can strip away the vegetation and look at the underlying bare earth. And obviously, you can imagine, we can now see the drainage features much better. In this case, I was looking at the bedrock geology, the volcanic North Mountain. And here is a break between a very resistant volcanic unit and a series of thin volcanic flows. Now, if we compare these data to the best available the province had at the time was a 20 meter DEM derived from stereo photogrammetry. Um, I think you'll agree that the, the difference is quite stunning. And of course, this is what has made LIDAR so popular. Now, we can take our digital surface model, our bare earth DEM, and a lot of people will call this a canopy height model, we like to use the term normalized height model because, of course, we have buildings in here and we can get those as well. And what this is showing us is the height above the ground of objects. It may not be that useful for us to see that a tree up here has a height of 320 meters above sea level. But it is important to our, for us to know that that height that is a tree that is 25 meters above the ground. So this is a very easy product that uh, can, be, can be generated in any GIS system where we calculate the normalized height. I showed you that uh, survey of, of uh, the New Brunswick shoreline, and this is uh, the musquash uh, uh, protected area. There is a digital surface model of the coast, and I, I threw this in because I wanted to show a good intensity map. This shows the intensity or the amplitude of the reflected signal from that near IR uh, laser pulse. So we can see the water is very dark. Uh, some of the vegetation is quite, quite light. And uh, so you've just got to think about the near infrared uh, laser pulse in order to understand that. We can then produce a hybrid, a color shaded relief with the intensity blended in. This obviously is a qualitative product, uh, more used for interpretation, but still, uh, these are standard things we do when we're looking at the LiDAR data sets and, and find it adds a lot to it. This is some work we did in the um, uh, mid-early 2000s, uh, 2005, 6, I believe, where we used e-cognition, derived a variety of different metrics from the LiDAR itself, and then produced a, a land cover map. And that was published in the Canadian Journal of uh, Remote Sensing. So this shows Annapolis Royal, the ortho photo captured at the time of the survey, and the derived uh, land cover map. Okay, let's talk about applications, and, and I could go on for hours about, about these, so I really want to move quickly here. Uh, forest inventory, I see there's some uh, talks coming up in the session this afternoon on that, look very interesting. Corridor mapping, so this is where we have that, that wider footprint sometimes of the laser. Geological mapping road construction, city mapping is very popular in Europe, moving to the US, Canada, eventually perhaps, deriving watersheds and stream metrics, I noticed another talk on that, very interesting, floodplain mapping, archaeology, and dot, dot, dot. I, I don't really have time to go through, through everything, but uh, the uses are very, very common. Here is a typical uh, topographic LIDAR survey where we generate cross sections in order to do the floodplain mapping. Now remember, 
Topographic LiDAR does not penetrate the water. So we're only seeing the top and not capturing the actual channel of the river system itself. That leads me to bathymetric LiDAR. Uh, this is showing you the Optech Shoal system. It's an older system, uh, deep water system that would penetrate two to three secchi depths. And that basically means you lower that disc until you don't see it any longer. And if the water is clear, the laser will go two to three times that. We really need clear water for this technology to work. It has two wavelengths, a, a near infrared and a green laser. The green laser is what goes through the water column. Now, these shoal systems were, were big. They had a long pulse length. So as a result, they couldn't really differentiate objects less than two meters, uh, which meant when you got into shallow water, they couldn't separate the water surface from the bathymetry. They were very large, drew a lot of power. As a result, you needed to have large aircraft, therefore expensive. Some of the other systems now, Optech has uh, a new seas mill system. Um, Fugro has a RAM system, Regal, and the Chiroptera from uh, Leica. And I'll just quickly, the beam divergence here uh, between the uh, Chiroptera and the, uh, the Leica system, or the, uh, the Regal system, sorry. Now, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the Chiropter because we were lucky enough to get another CFI grant and in 2014 purchased the Leica Chiropter 4X system. And to my knowledge, we're still the only academic institution to own a Bathy LiDAR. So it has two lasers, a near infrared and green, as well as a RCD 60 megapixel camera, red, green, blue, and near infrared. This shows you the typical green laser waveform. So we've emitted our pulse. We get a strong reflection from the sea surface. We go through the water column. Two things happen at this water surface that are important. One, the angle, the beam refracts. So the beam bends because we're moving from air into water. The uh, speed of light slows down, moving into that water. So we really need to know where the water surface is in order to adjust that angle and to compensate for the change in the speed of light. We go through the water column, and then we get a return back off of the seabed. And you'll notice that the, the beam is actually diverging quite a bit coming out. This system scans in an elliptical pattern, 20 degrees side to side, 14 degrees forward and aft. This just shows it in the uh, sensor in the aircraft with the cover off. But let's, uh, let's get moving here. So these show some of the areas we've surveyed since 2014. And I wanted to look at this area in River John because uh, we had surveyed the top of the, uh, the coast, and then we did a river survey, which I think holds a lot of promise. Uh, I'll go through this really quick. It's somewhat similar to the topographic LIDAR. We first pr process the trajectory. We then get convert our waveforms into point clouds. We go through point cloud classification, develop our raster products, perhaps do some value added, like mapping submerged aquatic vegetation. And then sometimes we'll push that out to a web service. We've also got some augmented and virtual reality taking place. So a variety of softwares can be used, a variety of customization. Um, our team has done great. Kevin McGuigan has done a fantastic job at automating most of this. Some of the research and development we're working at, uh, the LiDAR intensity, and instead of just mapping the amplitude of the intensity, we're also looking at things like the area under the curve, the shape of the curve, which may tell us more information about the actual seabed itself. More on that. Okay, this shows you the, the RCD30 information, and this is showing you the water surface right here. So you can see very little of the energy penetrates the from the near infrared. The green and blue, um, the green and blue of the camera, pretty good. And then here is our LiDAR system. Let's just look at that more closely. The energy exponentially decays with depth from a bathymetric LiDAR sensor. And you'll see here there's this fuzzy area which represents the vegetation on the seabed. So an interesting graph that I, I thought I would throw in, but I better get moving here. I don't have a lot of time left. Um, one thing, you know, bathymetric LIDAR had its origins in the charting world, hydrographic charting, so looking for hazards and so forth. 
it has evolved now into more ecosystem mapping, looking at what's on the seabed, what's the ecology, within the river system, what's the ecology. So to do that, we typically will go out and do a variety of ground truthing and map things like eelgrass or uh, fucus or kelp. Um, and we do that by put, using a GoPro camera and, and dropping uh, it over the side and, and taking photographs of the seabed. I also wanted to mention that the bathymetry data has its own set of unique classes. So you see here, for example, class 40 is the bathymetric information. 41 can be the water surface. The derived water surface is an actual modeled water surface. And then we can have submerged objects, but you'll notice we don't have anything here for submerged vegetation. And this is because this was driven really by uh, the International Hydrographic Organization, which are hydrographers interested in making nautical charts. So there's some room to, uh, uh, to grow those classes if we want to actually make unique classes for things like eelgrass. This is up in northern New Brunswick, a place called Tabinson Tack. And there's the LIDAR intensity. And I'll just point out, these, these bright areas would typically be sandy, the darker areas would be vegetated. We can then produce a, uh, an eelgrass height map. And sometimes we want to produce a presence absent map, absence map, there it shows that. If we compare, um, if we look at another technology, an a, a eco, eco uh, sounding type of approach, uh, echo sounding approach, <laughs> Biosonics is a great system where we go through, and this is showing us the plant height. So you'll see that we get more variation and we have good agreement between the LIDAR metrics and what the, the, uh, uh, the eco, uh, eco system is telling us. And if we look at our points, we get about 86 agreement with our, with our photographic points. This is just using handheld Garmin positioning. If we look at the biosonics for presence and cover, we're at about 92% agreement. So this, this system holds a lot of promise to map what's on the seabed as well. I'm often asked, does it work well in fresh water or salt? You know, is there a difference? It actually, the LIDAR is, is very minorly affected by salinity and temperature changes. So it works great in fresh water. This shows you a, a lake in uh, southern Nova Scotia. And if we compare the red contours from the LIDAR, you'll see how... Uh, the, the previous contours from doing lead line drops um, don't really depict the lake all that well. This is a little video where basically we're showing what, what it would have been like if we'd have flown topo LIDAR, and now we're revealing in a VR environment um, all of the information exposed uh, from the topo bathy side of things. We can see some, it uh, looks certainly like an anthropogenic feature there. Um, there's a variety of things. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead here. This is a LIDAR survey we did on Cow Bay, um, interested in oil protecting this tidal inlet from oil spills. More, um, we've expanded our classification beyond just eelgrass to try to get the full benthic environment. Still a very much an active area of research and development. Obviously, having this near shore bathymetry uh, can be very important for hydrodynamic modeling of things like storm surges, uh, wave run up, and so forth. We can see the, uh, the storm surge is increasing here. We'll eventually see it inundate up over this uh, uh, protected area of the road and inundate this back, um, back salt marsh bay area here and then come back out through there. Long. We did some work looking at mapping uh, seaweed height. Here it is at low tide, and at high tide, it more or less looks like a forest. But we were very curious, could we do with bathymetric LIDAR what foresters are doing with mapping the trees with topographic LIDAR? So this shows you the cross section, and this is a high tide LIDAR survey. The red represents the water surface, and we can see these two parallel bands in the point cloud which implies that this is the top of the canopy and this is the, the seabed itself. We also flew it at low tide and we confirmed that that was the seabed. Uh, so we published a paper on this, how we can map the height of the rockweed and therefore make a better estimate of biomass. 
Another example of doing benthic habitat mapping of, of kelp, rockweed, um, eelgrass, and so forth in the, the Lockport area. Another important feature is tracking pollution. So once we have these near shore high definition models, we can input them into hydrodynamic modeling software and track where there are pollution sources on shore making their way offshore. And really to show people that they linger around, even people in the Maritimes thinks, think once something hits the ocean, the tide takes it away. And of course, uh, that's not really the case. Uh, here's some examples. The province of Nova Scotia recently had their uh, entire um, province, we have had the entire province surveyed from uh, um, leading edge geomatics with their sensor. And this shows a cross section of the point density we're looking at there. I call it the GeoNova data. And then we flew a, a survey as well where we turned our, our topographic sensor up to 500 kilohertz. So incredible point density. And you'll notice here it has these multiple scanners. Um, we don't have five scanners, we have two, but Leica has recently came out with this ability to generate synthetic points as well from the data to increase the point density again. I really want to get to this river work here. So we were looking at river cross sections. Uh, this is the orthophoto captured at the same time as the, the elevation data. And if we look at these red triangles here, You'll see these are GPS points, and we've crossed the river. We were able to to get the entire area, and we see we have about a mean of nine centimeters, a standard deviation of eight centimeters. And uh, that's yours truly here with the GPS antenna, luckily above the, the water line, and just up to my neck. I wasn't treading water. And we see across this cross section, if we compare the DEM, we're at about that same, that same spec. And we can see any discontinuities are captured very well in the LIDAR. We can see the deeper channel uh, moving through here. Here we've pulled out just the LIDAR of the river and, uh, and put it against the orthophoto backdrop. We did some flood risk work. So these are the cross sections. That's the normal river flow. Uh, that's a 300-year return period. So you can see it's flooding that, uh, that flood plain. We also have the uh, velocity when we develop these hydrodynamic models. Um, now, if we want to look at the, the longitudinal profile, uh, here we see that there is a gradient going downstream eventually to the river. And if we compare the GeoNova, which of course only would see the top of the water, uh, versus our water surface, they're quite similar. And of course, here's the important part. Here's the river bed itself until we finally get to the ocean. And if I zoom in on that, you can see the river bed in much more detail here. And there are important things for fish passage, fish habitat, in terms of some of these nick points where it may be problematic to come up uh, and move through that system. So I've done a comparison here between generating the streams using the traditional D8 or D-infinity approach versus using a cost surface approach. I want to show you those results now. Uh, this is a little further upstream, but um, this is very a very common problem with topographic LiDAR. You'll see this red line, how it jumps back and forth, side to side, uh, depending on the water surface and any artifacts that are there. When we calculate the long profile, we always have an artificially too long of stream. If we compare that to the, um, using the top of bathymetric LIDAR, it didn't do a very good job at all. I was actually very disappointed with it. I done something with the cost depth, and you'll see that runs through the system, and it's trying to go from deep hole to deep hole. Let me show you another example. You may say, well, why not just use the map stream? Well, rivers migrate, and this river is migrating to the north here through time. This is the geomatic centered topo database uh, that shows the double line river and how it has moved over time. So that's not really an option. As I mentioned, I used the cost surface, and this is what the algorithm has calculated, going from deep pool to deep pool, simulating if I were a fish. Now, what did I use for the cost surface? I actually used the inverse of the depth. So the deeper the pool, the, least, the less the cost. 
And you can see it goes through. We can see some rapids here and so forth. But other than that, we are going from deep pool to deep pool and not making it too artificially uh, too much longer. Let's move to terrestrial LIDAR real quick. There are a ton of them. Here, the traditional survey companies all have uh, systems as well as the, the airborne LIDAR systems have their, uh, their systems as well. We had an ILRA system, and, and back in 2006, we started surveying some cliffs. Nathan Kroll did a great job on his master's thesis looking how we could use this technology for um, surveying steep banks and looking at coastal erosion. I'm going to show you a cross-section through here, and these are scans done in multiple um, time frames. The green was after a significant storm. So you can see how much of the bank was eroded. We're now going to be coming up. So I'm going to move on here. But a uh, very good tool for mapping uh, overhangs, any kind of vertical structure like that. These tech this technology is fantastic. Of course, it's used a tremendous amount in the forest uh, sector as well. Um, we had about a, a, a vertical limit of about four and a half meters for erosion. We've since uh, gotten a Polaris system. Very similar, except this guy will do a 360 scan and, and broaden the area. Now let's look at mobile system very quickly. Mobile mapping is basically taking the LIDAR system and the IMU and GPS and putting it on a, a, a vessel, a vehicle, et cetera. This is the early Titan system. Ted has all kinds of experience with this. This shows you the links uh, from Optech. And the, uh, something a little cheaper called the Dynascan 905 wavelength. We actually have purchased one of these. Uh, in evaluating it, they did a little drive around COGS. And there is the Center of Geographic Sciences. So uh, for all you COGS graduates out there, that was put in especially for you. Uh, and of course, you see we're not getting the roof. We're getting the, the sides of the building quite. We've mounted that on our ATV so that we can go and do those, uh, those kind of beach scans, but as well, very good for power lines, other types of structures. Like Now, if you want to map indoors, this is kind of a neat one. This is the, uh, the GeoSlam Zeb that's using the LiDAR, and it's using SLAM technology, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. But uh, those folks came and uh, surveyed a variety of our buildings, our interior of our buildings. And we've now merged that with some of the Dynascan data. I'm going to go here quickly. There's the Dynascan. Hey, no roof. Let's bring in the topobathy LiDAR. Okay, now we've got the complete picture. We've got detailed walls, we've got the roof, and we've got the interior. Tim, okay. we're, we're at about 47 minutes, a little bit more now. There aren't okay. any questions in the chat yet. So if All you right. want to just... Continue for a couple more minutes. It looks like you got lots of content. <laughs> yeah, no, but I'm, I'm, I'm winding down. I have two big topics left, LiDAR on a drone and uh, uh, building your own. And, so LiDAR on a drone. For the audience, uh, if you've got any questions, please get them into chat. Thanks. Uh, so the Matrice 600, um, you know, it's a big drone. Um, it's typically what is used for many platforms, uh, and, and there's a lot of Velodyne LiDARs out there. So we have an, we have an M600 here. Uh, it's got the Velodyne LiDAR and an Aplanix IMU GNSS system. It also has a, a, a nano hyperspectral camera. The entire kit is about 200K, so it's, it's not a cheap system at all. Um, the Velodyne LiDARs all use 905 uh, for a wavelength. This just shows you a cross-section through a host that we surveyed. Now, if you really look close, you might see that there's there's two lines here, which tells us we have a, a bore sighting issue um, that needs to get tightened up with uh, with this particular sensor. Uh, there's an example. Nathan Kroll is just uh, adjusting the system. We're about to do a survey on this coastal area that we work at. And as well, he threw up the EB uh, system with an RGB camera on there as well. So there shows you the point cloud of the uh, Velodyne LiDAR colorized by the uh, EB system. So we can see the field, uh, did a pretty good job on the vertical cliffs. We did two flight lines here. Um, you know, vertical cliff, very well captured. 
That's because we were flying offshore and the LIDAR was able to, uh, to image that. These, these movements here would be where the drone uh, must have pitched to the left or the right. And just showing you the definition of, uh, you know, can this replace the mobile LIDAR system as an example? And the beautiful thing of this is it's all direct georeferencing with the IMU. But we always need to check on those things and uh, make sure everything is working. And, and we can see that there's been significant erosion in the last 10 years uh, when we compare uh, some of those earlier LIDAR scans using the ILRIS uh, and, and DynaScan to the M600. Okay, my last subject. Thank you for your patience. To build your own system. There are more and more, because of the autonomous vehicle push, there are more and more of these lightweight LIDARs out there. So we have a project with NS Power. This is something Nathan Kroll is really driving forward with. Uh, we wanted to try to equip their trucks with a low-cost LIDAR to map power lines and vegetation. So it consists of a REACH survey-grade GPS, uh, the Ouster LIDAR sensor, uh, all driven with a Raspberry Pi. So the original system had the Ouster 1 64, so it had 64 channels, so 64 scan lines um, rotating around in this uh, uh, black part of the disk. Collects about a million points per second. It's got a 45 fit degree field of view coming off of this in 45 degrees, 120 meter range, Interestingly, it works at 850 nanometers. And there's some information on their website uh, telling you why that is. The, we've just purchased another unit, uh, the 128. So you'll see there it's doubled the number of beams. Uh, it's, as a result, doubled the frequency that, or the number of points one can collect. It does have a shorter range, but 50 meters is sufficient for the type of application we're doing here. And I just thought I'd throw this in to show you different resolutions between the, the, the 32, the 64, and the 128. And obviously, more points, we see more definition. Uh, closer we are, we see a higher density versus farther away. So there's the system uh, hooked up and in the truck, ready to collect some data. What we've also built into this is an open source, uh, actually it's through Google Cartographer, simultaneous location and mapping. This allows you to take multiple scans and by aligning targets in the scan, you can inherently figure out where you were positioned when you did the scan. This is going to revolutionize, I think, LIDAR, drones, and other applications where we will not need the high precision IMU information uh, as we do with the airborne systems and uh, elsewhere. All right, this just shows you the uh, what this little substation looks like. And here I'm showing you the LiDAR point cloud uh, that was captured in the ouster um, during this little survey. So there are the power lines. We're colored just by an elevation here, very simple. Uh, and we can see this little substation and all of the lines coming into it um, captured as we went around that small little trek. Okay, so here is that same substation, uh, quite a bit of vegetation around, colored by height. Now, we've actually been able to pull out the power lines in yellow and are looking at the proximity of the vegetation colorized from green being far away to red being close. This is a lot of work done by uh, Kevin McGuigan here at, the, uh, at AGRG. So... The idea now to be able to classify these points and look for vegetation that's getting close that could cause a power outage, uh, this is really the end game. Uh, we're also interested in mapping power poles themselves, and here is one of our first cuts that looks like it's doing a fairly good job. Um, if we look at, well, how good is the positioning of this? This is compared to the um, Esri base map information, and uh, between the SLAM and the post-processed survey grade GPS of the reach, um, the accuracy is fairly impressive. It's not a mobile mapping system to the same degree that uh, Leica, Optech, or Regal would be producing, but from NS Power's perspective, it more than meets their needs. 
And there we are mapping the, uh, the, the, the lines themselves. We have a little bit of misclassification with uh, down near the road. And of course, you know LiDAR has gone mainstream when they're starting to put it in the Apple iPad. So the iPad Pro now has a LiDAR. And, and why did they put that in there? It's actually something called a flash LiDAR. Uh, so it behaves a little differently than what I've been talking about. Uh, but they've done that to enhance the augmented reality experience with the, uh, with the iPad. Okay, so thank you again for your patience. So I'd like to just summarize. LiDAR has been around since the 60s, with, with, but it was really the invent of high-precision GPS and IMU that really allowed it to become a mapping system in the, in the mid-90s. Pulse rates have gone from kilohertz in the, in the early 2000s to me, uh, megahertz in uh, 2021. The initial systems, you had to choose between first or last return. Then it evolved to getting both then it's not uncommon now to get uh, 8 to 12 returns. Uh, the other big change is that GIS software has finally caught up and is now fully supporting the LAS format. So thank goodness we have no more ASCII XYZ uh, because we would not, oftentimes we wouldn't require, we wouldn't have the intensity, the angle, the echo code, a variety of other metrics that can make more the, the yellow IDAR more useful. Imagery can be often integrated with the point cloud. The LAS supports RGB values can be attached to that. It need not be captured. You can append RGB values independently. The top of bathymetric LiDAR, it started off for charting purposes, but it's evolved now into ecosystems, flood risk mapping, uh, riverine environments, and so forth. Terrestrial and mobile LiDAR, still an area that's growing. I don't think it's caught on as much as, uh, as people would have thought. However, with uh, BIM, building information, um, management systems, and so forth, uh, we're starting to see this grow more frequently. And, of course, I mentioned the autonomous vehicles have really pushed these light white puck LiDARs, being Velodyne and Oster. And I think the SLAM technology is going to really revolutionize a lot of things when it comes to um, low-cost LiDAR systems where we would don't have to get an expensive IMU. So many different wavelengths, pulse rates, return settings, beam divergence. So I hope I've enlightened you a little bit. And uh, again, it's a broad topic, um, but I would still say LiDAR is still superior to structure from motion from photogrammetry in, in vegetated areas. And uh, the ge direct georeferencing, uh, you just can't beat. So with that, um, I apologize if I've gone over my time a little bit. Thanks, but, Tim. Uh, okay, thanks, Tim. Um, so, so there's one or two questions that are starting to crop up, so I'll try to get a couple of those in quickly. So Ted asked, um, do you find that commercial LiDAR industry has also taken advantage of the advantages in the evolution of the technologies over the years or is there still an emphasis on quantity versus quality as provinces try to get more of their areas mapped yes yeah good gr great question uh i think seeing leica for example with that city mapper 2 and the terrain mapper 2 uh there's been some major advances there um to be able to fly at higher altitudes and, and to keep track of your pulses with this multiple pulse in air. Um, the IMU and GNSS technology has allowed us to get down to, like I said, probably six centimeter absolute vertical accuracy in the vertical. So uh, we've had improvements there in terms of the, uh, the precision. Um, and of course, the pulse density has gone through the roof. So... Uh, the LiDAR manufacturers are all pushing the boundaries here to produce, you know, higher density, more accuracy, um, trying to solve some of the issues of shadow problems and so forth, thus integrating oblique cameras with, uh, with the technology as well. Um, and as soon as one of these new sensors come out, many of the government agencies, especially in the United States, that becomes their new spec. So it's a, it's a race of which um, LiDAR service providers 
have to buy the latest technology in order to meet the latest specifications um, that the government and other clients are putting out there. Okay, thank you. Um, quick comment from Fiona Gregory, which which I'll just echo as well. That, that was amazing in terms of just the coverage of the evolution of the technologies, the principles, the applications, some of the results you're getting, and how that's evolved over time. That was an amazing talk. Thank you very much. My A pleasure. question from Roger, uh, Roger Wheat is, has pulse rate reached its limits at about two megahertz, or will it keep increasing? And what's the main benefit if it does keep increasing? Yeah, very, very good question. Um, I really don't know the answer. Um, I don't think there is any, any, uh, any reason in the physics why we could not keep increasing. Um, and and the other the other part of that question was: Has the pulse rate reached its limit? To or will it keep increasing? If so. Uh, it, what is the main benefit? Um, the, the real main benefit to that increased pulse density um, is to be able to fly higher. And, and the most expensive part of a LIDAR survey typically is the aircraft cost. And if you fly low, you need to fly more lines. And with every line, you need to turn and come back to, to fly the, survey, the next survey line. So if you can fly at higher altitude, maintain the same quality and the same density, then you can do it cheaper. Uh, and that is really the, the game here that the manufacturers are trying to give the edge to the LiDAR service providers um, by these improvements so that they can offer and fly more areas at a cheaper cost. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna, we're just running a little bit over time, but I'm going to slip in one last question that's come in the chat, which is from Peter McDermott. Um, what are your thoughts on the emergence or lack thereof of UAV swath bathymetric LiDAR systems? Yes, that's a great question. And I, I did not include, uh, Regal has something called the Rye Copter, which initially was a single profiling bathymetric LiDAR, uh, but they've been trying to advance it to be more of a swath LiDAR. Um, the, the big issue with UAVs and bathymetric LIDAR, in my opinion, is the power requirement. Um, the bathymetric system requires more power than a typical topographic system. And I, I should have also mentioned, that I may have missed this, that um, the pulse rate of the green laser on the chiropter system is only 35 kilohertz, compared to the topo pulse rate is 500 kilohertz. And that's why it's because we need to build energy up in the laser and then punch to try to get as much energy into the water column, eye, eye safety caveats aside, uh, in order to do that. So this is, makes it challenging from a power point of view on a, on a drone. And the second thing is drones are fantastic for surveying relatively small areas. Uh, if you want to survey an entire bay, like I've shown here, then we're still very much in the manned aircraft world. And for example, I don't see Leica trying to make a move to um, drone-based bathymetric LIDAR. Now that I've said that, they'll come out with an announcement tomorrow or something, but um, I've asked them on numerous occasions and they don't see the advantage there with respect to the issue of power, uh, endurance, and uh, size of the area. Uh, great to hear from you, Peter. Thanks very much, Tim. That was an excellent presentation, and thanks for your answers as well.